Okay, I'm about to. Mr. Pashipe. Uh, hello? Can you still hear me? I think I can someone do a thumbs up if you can still hear me. I can hear you, sir. Okay. Is uh, Mr. Fashi quite there? You can talk now. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, sir. Um, my colleague has spoken mostly about the school project that we have had and the um, use of Windows, intentional use of Windows for various like information and how we affect our business here in the well, there are some personal experiences, like personal project experience. Right? So I wanted to like share some of them. Also. There was this case where um, this was like uh, I did it was a um, multi-level um, story, like it was a multi-story design for an apartment housing. So due to the fact that first the building's orientation. The building orientation was facing, I think, the west part, like the, the approach elevation was facing the west part because of the size, the, the, the way the land was. So the longer part, the longer side was facing the west east um, plain, west east houses. Uh, so towards the front was, I think, the west part, while the back was the east part. So on the back side, um, the, the windows that were used were mostly. Um, one five windows because due to the client's requirements and all that, you wanted the use of four windows and all that. And the, 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 the um, spaces towards that direction were mostly like um, the, um, the bedroom spaces. And um, I think there's one teaching towards the back. So the teaching also had a terrace towards the back. And so because of the size of the windows, and the height of the windows that we were using, which was about one five one inch, we had to like reduce the size in terms of the so that way we were able to like create more space in the room for like the beds and all that because depending on the user, some might also want to use beds that have all these colleges and there was limited space because it was like a multi-story design. So we had to like try to plant the spaces well. And then also lighting also was like a major consideration because of the fact that you have um, some of the apartments are like going into each other at some point. So you want to like maximize the use of your spaces and now you try to lighten up the interior space. But one thing I one thing I usually considered was for the other part, which is the west part, like the front part. I mostly use um, verandas, like for almost all the design for the the, um, the living room spaces, the living room spaces as well as design. Because the living room and design was like space that was joined, so it was like just um, functions that separated it. So what I used was balcony. So like even because we mostly employed sliding windows, um, sliding doors there rather. So for the old design, like from top to bottom, all the different apartments on that part, the yeah, Azegarons had um, a sliding door that you can, from there, you can, you can offset light into the building environment because there was no even chance to like have probably cost ventilation for the room. So all you had was like parallel ventilation for both the room and dining. So we made use of like sliding doors so you can probably open your sliding door and to ensure that, okay, for security also, that was why. Like, we had balconies on the other side, so we are not just like having large windows that are just putting any out trying to gain as much lighting. But you also have balconies, so you can just probably open your balcony and you have both light and ventilation and all coming. So that was one major design. Then there's another one also that I saw. This one was a work for a particular client. The, the design was actually okay to me. I felt like the design was. But then the living room area, I said the, the living room, the dining area rather, was in a it was in a position whereby there were there were spaces on the side that was re receiving um, those ones had um, 
they were charged to receive like lighting and stuff. Like the Indians were stationed outside, so light was a bit um, coming. But then the dining area literally was like at the center of the house. So it was in a place where there was no way the window can get there or probably be <laughs> Fine, the dining was serving the purpose of circulation. It would allow you to access the rooms, the kitchen, the living room. But then that dining area now was just like on the phone. There is no lightning, there's no venture, except probably just little lightning coming from the living room area and getting to that space. So for that design, for me, I was like, okay, in as much as this person probably tried to, because it was a bungalow design and it was six bedroom bungalow. And the person managed the space and but then I was like, wow, oh, I've lost you. Oh, please come back to finish up that vital point you're talking about. Uh, Johanna, do you want to say something? I saw your hand raised earlier. Okay, I move to, if you want to say something, Joanna, please pop up to talk. Okay, uh, I move over to Mr. Fashipa. Hello, sir. Yeah, hello. Um, so, as I was saying, sir. Okay. The, the, the dining space that I saw, I thought, some level it was functional, but the lightning of the dining space, I felt like I don't know if there's anything that could be done because trying to like rearrange the space or something is going to like start the old design because it was like the dining was like the major area of circulation and distribution for the other space. So I'm now like lost on because trying to achieve probably lightning was not the major consideration when picking up that dining. I'm not sure, but the design was just in such a way that I don't see how that dining space can receive as much lighting as probably would be needed, except the use artificial lighting, probably all through the day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pashpe, for that wonderful uh, contribution. That shows that where you locate your space in your building, we influence the level of illumination available in those spaces. Uh, thank you very much. I move over to uh, Olua Femi Fashi Singh. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Fashi Singh. Yes, sir. I want to just contribute uh, some few points that affect uh, basically my own design. Feel free, please make it brief. Make it okay. Yes, uh, about I really feel uh, aesthetics, beauty, our windows. Uh, Victor Elias said our windows they affect uh, the beauty of our elevation. That was one factor. But another factor I consider is one, the size of the room, the size of the walls that I'm going to place the windows. Two, the function of the room, the function that the room serves. Maybe if I were to design a school now. Victor said, if we uh, during his during our crash design, we use lower windows. Some of us didn't use that, but most, let me say, most would have used it. But if I was to design an advanced, maybe a primary school or a nursery school, where those ones are already taking active part in learning, I will use higher windows because when they see outside, they tend to be distracted, and children are mostly, let me say, highly distracted when they see other things. So, the function of the space. The function of that room will affect my use of window as well. So as, as well as uh, the size of the room. Let me say in a living room now, I might use, I might decide to use a 1,800 uh, mm window in a living room compared to a room which I'll use about 1,200. So that is also another factor that affects my use of window in spaces. So thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. Very much for that for those wonderful contributions. 
Uh, I move over to Mr. Franklin. Are you there? We'll go over to now. This uh, this love uh, talk. Uh, okay, Mr. Franklin, can have it. With, 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 with. Okay. okay. Mr. Mr. Franklin, there are a lot of background noise where you are. There are a lot okay. of background morning, noise sir. where you are. Hello, Mr. Oh, Mr. Mr. Franklin, Hello, can you hear me? There are a lot of background noise where you are. If you can change your location, it'll be good. Hello, sir. Hello, good morning, sir. Okay, Mr. Franklin, please change your mute and let us have your contribution. Now, this is rule of thumb nine, and you have what's the size of window I have to use, okay? Let me put this size there. You can quickly do a, a, a rough check. It's a rule of thumb is like a checking, is a way to check space is adequate. Now, this is an hypothetical space. <laughs> I intentionally did not put the Mr. Franklin. I might need to meet that space for us not to think that it's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that we influence uh, a lot, a lot aspect of the design. Just for us to know how to apply the rule of thumb. Now, this is a space that only has a window and a door. The door opens outside and in the calculation, in, in the consideration of illumination, when you have a space with a door, we don't factor the door opening in as part of a as part of his now if that space here at all Hello, sorry, I don't know what's happening. Please let us uh, let us unmute ourselves because it's giving lots of uh, uh, interferences at my hand here. Can you hear me now? Can yes, you sir. Yes, sir. Please let us yes, unmute. Let us all mute up. Let us all mute up. <laughs> Oh, please let us all mute up. If you don't mute up, I will mute you permanently for my hand. I will mute you permanently for my hand. Please mute up. 
Because if it don't, it will continue to interfere with the uh, with the recording and it won't be clean enough. That what am I saying is now with this space, you can see you can calculate. You know that the rule of thumb says that it will start from the depth will be from one point five to twice the edge height of that uh, of that um, window. So of that window. Now, this is a window, and you can cal once you know the height of the window, you can calculate where the dark spot of that space will be, where the dark spot of that space will be. Now, here now, we believe that the height of the window is uh, 1.5 by 1.5 in height is is installed at the height of 900 and all the way, just the normal one that we use. To. This is a plan that I've drawn out. Now, once you know the height of the, of the window head, that means if you double that head, uh, that, let's say the head is at 2.4 meters, that means the efficient, effective illumination will stop at 4.8 meters from the window. That means any other spaces beyond that 4.8 meters will be classified as dark spot. Now, this is where your you, this is where you as, a, as the architect, you have to now make some decisions. Now, you have to decide how am I going to improve or enhance illumination of this space? Am I going to turn the whole of this space? Let me see if I can get my. Now, am I going to turn the whole of this space into a window? That is one. You have to decide that yourself. Or am I going to. Now, you know that this, let's say this is 4.8. 4.8 stops around here. Let's say all these spaces will now be well illuminated. Can you all see my illustration? Yes, sir. Yeah, this is 4.8. Oh, let me, okay. Now, 4.8 stops here. That means, let me change this color. Mm, let me put it as black. That means any, this, the whole of these spaces will now be dark spot. will not be dark spot. Now, as the architect, you now need to make decision, what am I going to do to address the dark spot issue that you have? We call it dark spot deficiency. We, to address the dark spot deficiency that you have in your space. Now, you can use different strategies. One, to impute, to have lighting shelf for your window. By the time you have lighting shelf, your edge height will be higher. That means you will have illumination to, into, into a deeper portion of the space. That is one strategy. Now, but the, the easier strategy that most of us used to do is to have another window into this space. Maybe we'll have another window to this side or to this side. Now, because I have my window, my dark spot here, does that make me to put my to put additional, let's say, and I decide that to put additional window here. What are the other factors I need to consider? I need to consider the aesthetics of my building. Are you getting it now? I'm, I need to consider the balance in ventilation. You know that if you put your window here, it will make your ventilation, the, the, the ventilation of the space to be balanced. To be ba balanced in ventilation that I'm talking about here is that when air is coming from here, it won't ventilate equally the old spaces that we have here. Look at it, it will go like this. Let me change it. Uh, it will go this way. Air yeah, will go this way, it will go this way. All these spaces will be ventilated. That means this space will not be ventilated. That, that's why you always 
as much as possible, it's always advisable to put your window at the middle point of a space. That means if I move my window from here, I move it to the middle of this, of this wall, I have this here, I can have the whole space, the ventilation to be balanced this way. That is why you see that I've not only considered window size alone, other factors have influenced the, uh, the, the balance of my ventilation and all the aesthetics of the building have all influenced my decision. There are other, there are other strategies that you can use. You can increase the width of the window. You can uh, change the wall material from concrete to a glazed wall. You know that by the time you change it to glazed wall or you have another window, you must consider its loss as well. And how was the temperature? What is the temperature of what's the level of heat that will be available in your space? I've only let us know that because for you to know that as an architect, you have to make decisions. And you know that decisions you are making influences lives influences the health of your occupants and all the rest. Uh, now, I uh, will continue with our lecture and we'll go to the part two of your lecture. Uh, moving over to part two, uh, which is... Uh, sorry, I don't know how I can... Uh, clear, oh, oh, good. Yeah, I've cleared it. Uh, moving over to part two, uh, which is on artificial lighting. Uh, artificial lighting refers to light sources from electric plants or light emitting elements. Uh, uh, lamps are in various, various shapes. Please let me, uh, let me, uh, the second, sorry, let me say something. Please, let's, uh listen carefully to this part this section is very 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 important very important you will be assessed on it from today and sport lot of other lot of the modules that will be doing will be focusing on this aspect please pay attention thank you let me start that part again. Yeah, you can. <clears throat> What's going on? Uh, moving over to part two, uh, which is on artificial lighting. Uh, artificial lighting refers to light sources from electric plants or light emitting elements. Uh, uh, lamps are in various, various shapes, color types and categories lighting designing to control uh light in color mm. on uh, one of the first steps in achieving control is identifying the quality of light that are desired for that space based on the function based on the use of that space and then selecting the proper lamp to provide them light sources are also called luminate that's why in the course of this project if in the course of this lecture, if you hear, uh, if you hear me saying luminaire or light sources, I mean the same thing. Uh, in recent decades, lamps and luminaire development has been particularly dynamic. We've had a lot of them, a lot of types of lighting sources available in the market. Uh, it's one offer better. They've been able to improve it over years, this one. Or each of them they have their pros and cons. That's why as actor you have to have this, uh, you have to understand the pros and cons of each of these are uh, artificial lighting sources. <coughs> uh, the first type of artificial lighting source that we we'll talk here, talk about here is uh, incandescent light. This was the first type of light that was that was developed. Uh, we don't really know the 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 year or the date of invention. But the two people that were credited with, 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 with credited with developing this uh, light is uh, Sir Joseph Swan, a British physicist, uh, and the other person is Thomas Edison. Uh, he was the one that first filed a patent 
for this uh, for incandescent light. Uh, and the this is first incandescent light use filament made of carbon. Uh, but in 1910, the carbon was replaced by tungsten, and that is what is still much of used today in some incandescent light. An incandescent lamp creates light by passing an electric current through the filament, which is made of tungsten, a material with a high resistance to electricity. The resistance to the flow of electricity causes the filament to become heated. If the resistance is high enough, the filament will become so hot that it gives off light and becomes incandescent. And become that is the process of incandescence that we have in, in, in incandescent light. However, incandescent light are of lowest efficacy as any electric uh, any of the electric sources. Uh, as you know that little percentage of the wattage of the power consumed by uh, of the energy consumed by incandescent light even in research said that less than three percent of energy consumed by incandescent becomes light that is why if you own incandescent light in your room they tend to emit increased heat because larger portion of the energy consumed by these lamps are converted into heat and that's why it's the, in some species they use incandescent light to produce it to eat up in space uh the second type is the halogen lamp uh this differ from the older incandescent light in two ways uh that is that it has improved efficacy and it has improved extended uh lifespan the bulb is made of cuts instead of glass uh second the atmosphere inside and that means the gas inside the the the, 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 the bulb is 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 uh halogen gas uh the light produced by halogen lamp is described as whiter or bluer than that of the incandescent uh bulbs halogen lamps have a lifespan more than twice as long as comparable incandescent halogen light is approximately twice as efficient as the holding incandescent, uh, that means it, uh, it offers more light compared to uh, more light. Uh, that means uh, it offers uh, a larger portion of the energy consumed by halogen light is converted into uh, light. Halogen uh, uh, lamps uh, in uh, in halogen lamps. The evaporated tungsten combines with these are part of the technology uh, that they process it, the technology involved in the development of uh, halogen lab. Let us read this up and let us have it at the back of our mind. Uh, the third one is the fluorescent lamp. Uh, fluorescent lamps are entirely different technology uh, than uh, to compare to incandescent lamps. Uh, rather than creating heat to produce light, uh, they create ultraviolet light to stimulate phosphorus, which in turn produce visible light. Uh, this is this process, the, the process of uh, converting uh, ultraviolet light uh, to visible light through the stimulation of phosphorus is called fluorescent. Uh, fluorescent lamps begin with a sealed tube of glass with an electrode at each end. Uh, the tube is filled with one of the several gases, typically argon, krypton, krypton, neon, xenon, or uh, often two of these together, two of these together and mercury. Uh, when the electric arc that is produced between these two electrodes, the electricity flow through the mercury uh, causes it to emit ultraviolet uh, light. Uh, and in this process, the ultraviolet light emitted by this mercury uh, is uh, inside the inside the the fluorescent lamp is converted into uh, visible light uh, by the stimulation of the second gas that the uh, second gas that is inside that tube, which can be any of the two phosphors 
and by this this will convert the ultraviolet light to visible light and this will provide illumination into our space let us read more about this and let us understand the diagram very well uh it's it will benefit us as a mover uh the other one is high intensity discharge lamps uh, like fluorescent lamps high intensity discharge lamps are uh, used in ballast to create an hack in a gas function <coughs> called the hack tube the content of the hack tube however produces visible light without the need of the need for phosphorus that's one difference between high intensity discharge and uh, the fluorescent tube you can see that one has been an improvement over the other uh, uh, the halogen offer improvement on the fluorescent uh, incandescent uh, lamp, while the fluorescent offer improvement on the halogen. Uh, the high intensity discharge offer improvement on uh, on other types, other previous types. Uh, uh, HIDs can be single or double-ended tubular tubular lamps. They are often enclosed in an outer bulb to protect the lamp and other filter out excessive UVs. HID lamps can be dim, but their response is not like that of incandescent and fluorescent lamp. Uh, they respond much more slowly than other light sources. As you know that would. those light that can glow, they will start very dim and as you as as uh, as you leave it, leave the light on, it will continue to glow. Those ones are high intensity discharge. The other one that is like the latest is the light emitting diode that we always call the LED light. Uh, LED light offers, uh, is, diff is, diff is different from the previously discussed light sources in very significant ways. Uh, LEDs are solid uh, with no gas or vacuum chamber, so they are also pre referred to as solid state lighting. Uh, LED naturally produce directional light, as we see. Uh, many of the directional lights that we have, uh, uh, many of them are LED lights. Uh, LEDs are com comprised of two layers of material sandwiched together. The first material is generic, generically referred to as P. Let us read about this, uh, about the technology about this LED light very well. Let us understand the diagram um, for us to be able to uh, have basic understanding of many of these lighting sources. Uh, in continuation, we have to understand that, uh, as I said, uh, uh, artificial light sources come in different types, come in different shapes and sizes. We have to understand many of these, how these shapes and sizes are, are, are done uh, because uh, 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 we have some that are around flowers and all the rest. You can see many of the different shapes that we have here. But there are ways to identify them. Uh, uh, we'll talk about this later on. Uh, until mid-20s, it was possible to know the technology of just a bartender lamp based on its shape. Because before then, incandescent comes in a particular shape, halogen comes in a particular shape, fluorescent tube comes in a particular shape, and all the rest. Uh, the most, uh, today, manufacturers have fitting multiple technologies into traditional lamp shapes, uh, giving designers and consumers more options than ever, but also separating lamp technology from lamp shapes. The most common shape, the hay lamp, for example, is available using in incandescent halogen, compact fluorescent and LED technologies. Uh, that means the whole, the, the A shape that we all know about incandescent, if you see any lighting source that is a shape now if you think they are all in country you might be wrong because you can you might have a lead light inside that uh, that uh, that's a shape uh, ball and you might not know about you that's why you have to understand how this uh, understand different shapes and sizes of all these la of these light lamps uh, the wrong lamp shapes will put uh, the center of the light in the wrong location. Uh, <coughs> that means for the kind of lighting that you have, kind of if lighting effect you want to experience, this will inflate a kind of shape 
of light you have uh, because the shape also affects the direction of illumination uh, that provided by this lamp. Each lamp shape is available in several sizes. Lighting fixtures are designed to accept only one lamp, lamp shape of only one size. That's why you have to understand, you know, the whole way that we used to use in candescent. They will tell you, uh, you have to buy a, a bulb that is, uh, is it the screw, the one with the screw, or the one with the pen, with the two pen. If you, if you, if your lighting support or lighting fixture is the is accommodating the one with the pen, and you want to buy the one with the screw, you know that you won't be able to use it. The same thing goes to the fluorescent tube. You know, before we used to have fluorescent tube with the two pins at each hand and all the way, but now you have fluorescent tube that you can just screw. We have fluorescent tube that you can just slide in. If you go to buy, if you have your lighting fixture is the one that accepts fluorescent tube that you can just slide in, and you went to buy the fluorescent tube with the pin that you know that you won't be able to use it. That's why you have to understand those kind of uh, the, the, the different shapes and size that we have for each of these lamps. Uh, well, as I said earlier, you have to describe this. You have to understand ways that lamps. I describe as well, and it's, I've given three examples here. The incandescent hair and allergen light, you can see that uh, uh, some of them you see this, uh, this like a code written on the, or a description on it. You see a uh, 60G40 slash W. The meaning is the wattage is 60, the shape is the G shape, size, the size, the, 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 the diameter, the long, the largest diameter is 40 and the additional information is offer is w which means white that means it produces white light you have to we have as architects as professionals involved in buildings let us understand how these that means if you see something like this that your electrical engineer has written in the lighting the lighting design you you'll be able to read those kind of uh, lighting design also fluorescent lamp uh, lamps is described you see them you see f32 t8 slash 830 uh, this means that uh, it's a 32 wattage t8 linear fluorescent with cri of 84 and a color temperature of 3000 k uh, that is how it's being described uh, let us read more about it that provided the guide for us to understand it for the lead light there's there's because it's still a sector that is still developing there's uh, there's no generic way standardized way to describe it that's why you have to refer to to the manufacturer's uh, guide for you to be able to understand uh, many of to know to under, to know and identify some of these lead lamps uh, Selecting uh, selection of light sources, you have to uh, factor in. Uh, 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 giving us five different uh, factors that you have to consider. Uh, uh, lighting designer must know so much information about the simple light bulb that it can make the process of choosing a light source seem overwhelming. Uh, as you have to, if you, if you have issues to identify the kind of uh, light sources you need, you can refer to your local supplier and they can offer guidance to you. Uh, you can refer to the manufacturer's manner, manual or guidance. They can offer advices in that aspect. But in selection, in, in selecting your lighting sources, you have to consider the lighting output. That is how much light does it produce? Uh, because if you, if you need a space that, that that you don't need intensity, uh, need need the space to be highly illuminated, and you give them a bulb that will illuminate, that will highly illuminate the space. That means you might, will be offering excessive illumination to spaces that it will affect the function of the space. That means you have to understand the lighting output of that light source. Uh, you have to understand the quality of light. If you need a light that is white in a space 
like if you are designing space that for reading and you are providing red light for those spaces you know that you defeated the function of the space you have to understand how the light will be controlled you have to understand the energy efficiency of the of the light source and you have to understand the maintenance and cost of ownership because each of these as i said daylighting is free but artificial lighting is not free you have to understand how this uh what's the cost of this artificial lighting and how will it be maintained if the artificial lighting is in a space that is not easily accessible you have to understand that you need to provide artificial light sources that does not need frequent maintenance and those are considered those are factors you have to consider and i provided a table comparing all these light sources uh in reflection this is a space uh you can sketch your studio and uh, show the location of all the luminaires and this will help you to understand how lighting is yeah this is a uh, uh, another reflection uh this is uh we started this calculation uh in the last module so we dealt into it in details today uh you'll be tested you'll be you meet a lot of questions uh as you move on in this uh, course that will look like this if you are given this a space with this kind of lighting and we're told to determine the amount of illumination of that space and that means you have to get a house you have to get that house you have to get the house and uh, 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 if you refer to the calculation we, that we had in module two, module three, uh, you can see the luminance per lamp, the coefficient of utilization, light loss factor, and area per lamp. Once you do this, you can determine your uh, illumination straight away. Uh, uh, please, if you have any issue with this, put it in the discussion board because of our time is fast fast paint, put it in the discussion board. I want you to go to uh, engage with this module and practice this question. If you have difficulty to understand how we came, we realized the answer, put it in the discussion board. I will offer advices for you and be able to understand it. But you, as I said, you will meet a lot of questions like this and even more complex than this. This is just the basic one, and you have to practice it for you to be able to understand it. Uh, here, you can see that this is a description of uh, a, an incandescent lamp and a 60 wattage, uh, 60 wattage lamp. And it's giving you uh, 40, sorry, it's giving you a white lamp uh the size is 40 mm and the efficacy of that lamp of, of each of those lamp is 80 lumen per wattage that means for you to determine the, the the lumen for each lamp it has to be the wattage times the efficacy and that's how you work it out by the time you work it out you put it into the cap into the formula and you're able to get your illumination level straight away and I would like to point out, uh, uh, sorry, I would like to point out this, uh, 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 one of the, uh, one of the reading resources, Lighting Design Basic by Mark Karen, and go and download, you can download this in the reading resources for the module, please use that book very well use that book very 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 well use that book very well you see you meet a lot of questions a lot of questions from that book is very good the book is very good the book is very interesting it's easy to read please download it and read it very well uh, also 
Uh, I don't know if there's any question and answer for me before I still have like uh, eight more minutes to the end of the class. This is the time to have for you to, if there's any question, any comment that you have, please feel free to let me know those comments and we can have a conversation on it together. Any comments? Any comments for me? So, yeah, I'm listening. Feel free. Okay. Uh, the book they say you should read. Um, yes. Is it like summarized with this model, this current model? For is there a limit yes. with it? Yes, it's there. It has a lot of details. There, it was part of the book I used to prepare the model. Okay, so I mean, once we read through module four, we would like not really need to read through the, uh, the book for the exam. Uh, <laughs> for you to, especially for the calculation aspect, are you with me? Yeah, I'm with you, sir. For the calculation aspect, you will need you if you want to read that book, you can read it for you to have more for you to be able to practice more calculation. Okay, sir. Okay, you sir. get what I'm saying? Yeah, I do, sir. I do. Uh -huh. That is why I have I, I give you the access to the book, please. Go and read it very well. It's very interesting. The book is easy to read. It's not difficult okay. at all, please. Uh, and don't forget uh, our our this thing. Uh, don't forget to register for the. Hello, can you mute up, please? Can you? Can we all mute? I think I won't give you people access to unmute again. And I want to, I want, I intentionally leave that opportunity for you to mute and on me for us to create, to have engagement uh, doing, but many people you just, uh, you leave your, your, your audio on. Uh, yeah, Picayo, you want to say something? Sorry, it was a mistake, sir. It was a mistake, sir. Okay, okay. Now, uh, please, I want to remind us about the, uh practice session coming this is very very vital for you to participate in it uh, please go and register for it and you see a lot of this all of them here they are all ceos all of them and they are all from the key professions that we have in uh in the built environment they are all involved they are all, uh, they all have when I read their bios for you in during the during the practice session, you will see that they have long years of experience. Uh, please, and uh, uh, I I would like to ask if there's any comment for me. Let me know. Uh, once you register, uh, I, I I believe everybody registered. Uh, I believe everybody registered. Once you registered, I might not need. You do might not need to put in your matric number. I can get your matric number straight away from the registration platform. And please, that means next week, next week, hello? Yes, sir. Next week on Thursday, we'll be having our uh, live section. And on Friday, we'll be having the practice session, please. Let us participate in hall. And don't let's forget your, for those that have not submitted your assessment to, the deadline closes today. Very soon it closes. And uh, uh, your assessment three will be released before next, uh, before the practice session that we have next week. If you have any question for me, please feel free to, it on the discussion board or on the WhatsApp group. And as I said at the beginning of this lecture, your engagement will be assessed. Uh, 
the quiz for module three has only been done by six, six participants. Your, the quiz for each of the module and the discussion board is very, very vital. If you just go through the module and you don't have any comment to make, it will affect your engagement in that module by the time I assess it. Please ensure you go through the, the discussion board, make a comment on what has been posted on the question we are, on the issue that we are discussing, comment on another person's comment, and you'll be good with that. And also attend the quiz is very important. I can I think for like three days after we had the last session, after the after we had the last session, uh, the live session for module three, only one person did it. I know the person very well. Please uh let us engage fully with each of the modules. Thank you very much. Uh have a wonderful day and uh I wish you good luck and please uh enjoy yourself and take good care of yourself bye everyone bye sir thank you sir you're welcome thank you sir you're welcome bye i'll be closing the platform in the next uh three minutes